Welcome to our show, Hollywood Structured. My name is Eliane Chauvin. I'm a television director and an actress. After viewing a very good show on West 57 Streets a few weeks ago, which concerned itself with the arrival of hundreds of kids every day in this town, hoping to become stars or singers, and who end up as transients and drug addicts, prostitutes, because of all the misinformation that they read in magazines and in newspapers, or what they see on television. I decided to remedy that. I spoke with a couple of friends of mine and decided to produce a show which would inform the parents, the educators at large, and the youngsters about what to expect and what not to expect in this town. To inform them about the pitfalls and the rewards of Hollywood very often the pitfalls of Hollywood. I think being a drama coach for the last 20 years, I've seen people come in this town, come and go. I've seen other people come and stay. I've seen other people come and succeed. Now the difference between the youngsters who arrive and end up as prostitutes or drug addicts and the people who start working in the industry are twofold. One is preparation, and one is expectation. Now, expectation. If you expect to be discovered tomorrow or yesterday, it's not going to happen. If you expect to be student forever, that won't do it for you. Now, you should be student for a while. You should be in a good workshop. And then maybe you will be discovered, or at least you will be working in the industry. Not necessarily as actors, but maybe you will find another niche. You become a producer, you become a director, you become a uh, set designer, you become a dialogue coach, you become uh, casting directors. Who knows? But don't close any door to yourself. Now, I would advise the parents to not let their youngster leave home with less than $2,000 in their pocket and a car or the money for a car, second-hand car, it doesn't matter. The distances in Hollywood are enormous. Hollywood is not just a strip that you see usually on television that is about 25 blocks where you see the name of the stars in cement. Hollywood has many, many communities. It goes from the sea, Santa Monica, into the valley to Encino, to Tarzana, downtown, and it's 40 miles. So you do need a car because buses here run every half hour. There are no subways. This is not Chicago. This is not New York. So the $2,000 could be used as, for example, the first $700 will go to join a union, without which you cannot work in this industry. The union is called the American Federation of Radio and TV Artists. It is open. You can go, put your money down, and say, I want to belong. And if you belong, maybe then you will get an agent. The second money that you will use will be for your rent. Uh, it will cost you probably three to $350 a month. You have to pay first and last month. So now you already have $1,400 wiped off from the $2,000 that you came with. You should find yourself a roommate, not somebody that you pick up on the boulevard, but somebody that you meet through your friends, through a good workshop, through your agents. Now you have left $600, which should be used in that manner. You need money for food. You need money for gasoline. You need money for phone calls, or at least you have a phone installed. You need probably $150 for pictures. The rest of the money should be used to join a very good workshop. There are many schlocky outfits in Hollywood, but they are very good workshops with good reputation. And that's where you should end up. Because the other people there are already working in the industry, and they can be your friends, they can be your guide, they can help you get an agent, get your first job. Now I would like to welcome our first guest today, Miss Jacqueline Bissett. Hello, Jacqueline. Hello. Uh, as you heard with what I was talking about earlier, we want to talk about the debut of all actors, producers, and so forth. And the way people may start as a model, may start as a dancer and a singer, 
and fall into acting, or the reverse. And uh, if you would be kind enough to explain to us how you first started, did you always want to be a, an actress? I didn't always want to be an actress. I, I didn't know what the job was I wanted. I knew I liked um, certain subjects better than others. I didn't know what the job was. You know, I think I think that's a lot of people's problems. They have a capacity to do something here and something there, and they think, what the hell is the what, what is the equivalent in the job? I knew I was good at English. I like words. I was musical. I was always interested in people. I was terribly shy. Desperately shy, reserved is what the way. Is it? Uh, I liked painting. I loved ballet. Did you do any acting in school? Very little. I mean, nothing of any consequence. Did you do any dancing? Any? Well, I danced, you know, not professionally. I danced for a long time. I was always very, I was very attracted to the theatre on a certain level, but I didn't know. But you know, it didn't come into my the world that I was in, what that job was. And the word theater or cinema was something that was I was frightened of. Did you do it? the connotation of, of, of that, that connotation that actually hangs around the world of acting, which is the people who, the sort of tacky area of the world. And uh, in fact, I think it's a very honorable profession. Now, you, you, you were born and raised in England, mm -hmm. OK? Um, mm -hmm. Did you do any modeling? Did you want? I did some modeling. I did some modeling, rather unsuccessfully, because I wasn't really the right shape, <laughs> and I didn't have the right kind of hair at the time. It was in the sixties, and um, I managed to get a real sort of inferiority complex built up through that period. Because I mean, I was always. You know, I think it's very important. It's rather like when you you choose a man who uh, it's best to choose someone who likes what you have. I mean, you know, rather than so many of us go through life choosing the wrong kind of person who sort of basically puts up with the fact that your bottom's too big or whatever it is, or whatever it might be, where you prefer some baseball. I think you have to find, in life, it's going to be a long stretch. Whatever you choose to do for work, it's going to be a long stretch. You'd better find something that suits you. I think you can have aspirations to go all over the place and do all kinds of jobs. I mean, I had aspirations to be an astro... Uh, um, I've the word now. Uh, Astronaut? No. Uh, Astronomer? No, no, no. You go to digs. Um, oh, archaeologist. Archaeologist, you know, without the education or anything. It was a dream. I had aspirations of being a, a doctor without having the mathematical or the scientific background. But your father was a doctor. Yes, but I mean, you know, you, I think, first of all, you've got to be fairly realistic. And it's too easy. I think so many people start off with, with a fantasy. That's just a load of old rot. You just, you can have a fantasy, but it's got to be based on something that, you're, that you are able to do. You want to, you know, it's like you want to be a ballet dancer, you've got to have a certain kind of body. You can develop your body to a certain degree through the, through the practice process. But you can't go beyond your body. You want to be a dancer. You have to have, you know, you, can, you, you have to have certain hands to be a pianist. You have to have certain stretch. You need certain things. And I think a lot of people's unhappiness comes with their lack of reality. Do you think that sometimes they are either pushed or repressed by their parents or their friends, saying, oh, you'll never do it, you'll never make it, and therefore they say, oh, yes, I am going yes, to do it, and absolutely. there's too much expectation? I, don't, I, don't, I think it's good to have expectation, but I, you know, that acting is a very, we could be very ready, you don't have to look a certain way as an actor. But you've got to learn how to stand, and you've got to learn how to speak, and you've got to learn how to move. And those are those prerequisites of just of, of, of being a human being. Um, I think some of the most surprising people make it because they have more will and they'd be put down more, really, sometimes than, than others. But I see a lot of people who, who, who go into a lot of, um, have a lot of dreams based on just, for example, being born a pretty person, for example. And it's just not enough. And uh, I think preparation is something that I've often talked about with you. I think you have to, you prepare your life, your, the idea of going to school is to prepare you for the world. Unfortunately, schools don't prepare you for reality, and they certainly don't prepare you for an artistic reality in any kind of, um, you have to do a lot of homework on your own. I think you have to develop your eye to learn, you have to go and see theater if you want to be an actor, you have to go and see films, good ones, bad ones to go to art galleries, you have to have, develop your aesthetic sense, you have to listen to good music, you 
to read good books. You have to develop your, your, you are your own instrument. And, and uh, the quality that you will bring to whatever the job is, is what you've learned in your life. You can't expect your teacher to give you all of that. You can't obviously expect to have all experiences in this period of a short period of time, but you can, you can add to your experience by cultivating yourself. Um, Not just sitting home and saying, I wish I was a movie star, I wish I was a great singer. You, you have to go bloody do the work. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. So you at a young age did not know exactly what you wanted to do. You, yeah. you, were, you were going in many, many directions. Mm. What brought you to acting and or, first of all, how many jobs did you do before you got there? How did you help yourself? Well, I started, I mean, I was at school and I worked you know, as, a, as a waitress actually for a while and uh, that made me realize how interested I was in people at first. I just accentuate. I never admitted that I wanted to be an actress. I just. It was just too, just too tacky for words. And I knew my family would hate it. Which, in fact, they didn't. I was wrong. <laughs> a lot of times you limit yourself. Anyway, I went to, to, to earn some money to pay back some money out to friends and stuff, and I, then I, you know, I just sort of, I just took my independence at a certain point. I said, well, that's it. No more protection from anybody, and I'm going to try my own to do what I can. I'm going to try and earn some money so I can go back to school, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Because I don't want to be limited by what people tell me before I even try it out for myself. It's as if I, I wanted to go quietly and do it in secret, really. So were you and, still uh, in school? No, I was out of school, but I was, I was at that awful stage when you left school, and you just don't have an idea what the job's supposed to do. And you know, everyone's pushing, you've got to make a decision, and you know it's going to be your life. And I knew it wasn't, I knew I didn't want to get married and, and go through that traditional uh, route at that time. I'd been encouraged to, my mother always encouraged me to, to study and to dream of going to university or whatever. And I wasn't really particularly interested in that, but I, I kind of got the message, what she was saying basically was, you know, learn, go to school. Um, so in fact you did go to then dramatic school? Well, no, I didn't go to dramatic school actually. I started, I went to some classes, I had some rather horrendous classes with a very theatrical woman. I said, this is not what I thought I wanted. Definitely. But I really had done a lot of dancing. Mm -hmm. I knew how to stand for a start, and I knew to a degree how to, you know, deportment and stuff like that. I spoke pretty badly, didn't know how to breathe. Oh, I you know, see. You know. uh, I looked right for the, for, the, for the thing, I mean, whatever that, to a degree. Um, I was interested, I had an education of some sort wasn't totally uncultivated, but I mean I had everything to learn, everything, but I was an avid, uh, avid learner, let's say, and um, I, I was lucky to, to hit the period in cinema that was really fascinating, which was sort of uh, you know, the early 60s, French films, Italian films and all that stuff, which just inspired me completely, just obsessed me, and as I want to be part of whatever that is, I don't know what it is, but I want to be part of it. One day I want to walk down the street like Jean Moreau in a film called La Notte and uh, just inspire the people. What, doing what? She didn't actually do anything. She just was amazing. How did, uh, did your first break come, actually? Well, the first break, I suppose, was uh, going up for, well, I did a little modeling and I walked into the Vogue office at, in London of uh, David Bailey, who was a very famous photographer who was interviewing girls for a part. He wanted an unknown girl, and he was with Roman Polanski in the office. And they said simultaneously to me, you're too fat. <gasps> simultaneously. I thought, wonderful. I just, I mean, I was not gross. I was just, well, they saw this image of the skinny 60s girl, you know. I went to see a play that, I remember I went to see Son of Oblomov that night. I don't think I saw anything. I just saw images of fat. Just a diet that they, they told me I had to go on a diet if I was going to even test. And uh, total humiliation. But they were going to test you. They said they'd test me if I lost 12 pounds in about you know, 10 days. And uh, I had to test twice. I didn't get the part. Thank God I didn't get the part. I could never have done the part. I was totally unprepared. And this fascinating actress called Francoise Doriac. Oh, yes, I know. Who was the sister mm -hmm. of uh, Catherine Deneuve. Mm -hmm. 
she got the part, and I got a little tiny part, which was already quite enough for me to handle. And I just sat on the set, uh, I was just mesmerized, me absolutely drug, you know, I was just in a state of complete intoxication, fascination, and uh, I said, this is it, I know what I want to do, this is it. Said a few words, had a few nightmares, uh, went through quite a lot of humiliation, and... Um, what was the name of the movie? A cul-de-sac. Polanski's uh, mm -hmm. his, his third film in the... In the, in the, in the, in the and then you did two for the world? Yeah, then I didn't hear anything from anybody, and I did. I went back to trying to do some modeling jobs and stuff. Now, did you get an agent through, through getting that job? I got an agent. I had to get, yes, I had the job. I got the job before I had an agent. And then I got an agent, with having already got the job, so they didn't actually get me a job. That's always a very strange thing, you start. The union and the, and the they haven't. Yeah, the young people always. Yes that you can get an agent by just walking in and say, here I am, take me. You know? It doesn't happen that way. No, but of course it's always very hard to say that you've got to get a job before you get an agent. It's, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation, that. And that's the same everywhere. Um, and then you didn't work for a while. I didn't work and um, I went up for a little bit. I went up for things, you know, I went for different things. I got, didn't get them or I did get them all. And I got uh, little bits in movies and sort of, basically it was sort of extra work, really bits and pieces and uh, it didn't bother me at all. I, at anything, I never did anything that I say that I thought was really uh, going to be a rubbishy film. I didn't understand the filming process either. I didn't understand really the job of a director or as opposed to a producer or all those, the editor. I didn't really understand the concept of a script. I didn't really know that an actor's words, somehow I thought that actors sort of said what they felt like. <laughs> I was still at that stage really and not really believing when you saw a great movie that it was all written down, every single thing was choreographed and worked out. But the whole thing was a matter of great precision. So you actually learn on the job? I basically did learn on the job. And I get very quiet when I work and I would be very, very polite. People would say I was terribly polite. And I would try and be basically invisible on the set so that I could watch and uh, try to make as, as few ways as possible. I think it's very important to learn to be, I mean, I think mo mod modesty, I really do think it's important. I think a lot of, I mean, you've got to know when you're going to bring your energy in to get the part. You've obviously got to know when to, when, when to be ready to fight and everything. But I think a lot of people, the business is such a hair-raising jungle for so many people. And they get so fed up with people being emotional and uh, those trying young actors being capricious and star numbers when they're really absolutely not in a position to do that. Because actually stars don't do that. It's not stars don't do those numbers. It's beginners who do those numbers usually. And um, this is the pitfall that I was uh, talking about earlier. Uh, so I think a little modesty. And, have, and being a little great gratitude when you get a chance to be on a set with professionals and to watch them. And I, I think it, I think in any job, if you watch people who are successful at what they do, you can learn from them because they've made it and you haven't. Do you, you can't imitate people, of course, but you can sort of. Um, You don't you know, arrive and say, well, he knows his lines, but I'm going to make a number and I'll, I'll wing it, you know, I'll come in, I'll wing it because I'm so smart. I won't learn my lines, I'll show them, I can just, you know, whatever. And I've seen that happen. Instead, instead of being a professional. Instead of being a professional and, and uh, thinking that people will be patient and amused by it. They're not. They're not. Welcome back. We'll have more of Jackie Bissett in another episode. As you may have detected, I have a slight accent. Even though I'm an American, I was born, raised, and educated in Paris. So if from time to time I make a mistake in my speech, please forgive me. As a matter of fact, I made a big mistake in another episode in which I told young actresses to have pictures taken with blouses, suits, and nightgown. What I truly meant to say was evening gown. Excuse me. In other episodes, you will meet producers, directors, 
casting directors, agents, who all started, as I said earlier, wanting to be actors. They will explain to you the transition that they have made and how it can be worked out with no damage to your pride. I would also speak next time about resume. Resume, which is a piece of paper stating what you have done in school as far as the acting profession is concerned or as far as your skills are concerned. Usually you put your name on top of the page and there are actually two resumes. There is one for commercials and there is one for acting, drama or comedy. In the resume you will put all your vital statistics like your height, your weight, not too heavy, and your age range. Uh, on the dramatic show you will only put your age range and then put your credit of film, television, uh, special skill, education, and training, dramatic training. Um, we're getting to the end of our show. So I will say to you, please, keep watching us because we're going to keep watching out for you. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.